Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for coming to uh, the third um, lecture in the Herbal Balan Lecture Series. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the Taipei Cooper program, which is a postgraduate certificate program, um, mainly in typeface design, but also uh, consists of other workshops in typography design. Um, so, um, Type Cooper. Um, my other role is the curator at the Herbal Balance Study Center of Design and Typography, which is where I'm, I'm sitting today. Uh, both Le Balance Center and Type of Cooper present the lecture series. The lectures are part of the extended program in typeface design, um, and so um, they are uh, kind of an integral part of the uh, education of Type of Cooper, but obviously open to the public. So we welcome everyone watching us uh, from across the world. So thank you for joining us um, at um, various time zones. And if it's a difficult time zone, we appreciate you especially joining us today. So thank you for coming. Um, Today is the third lecture. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Type Culture uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to record these lectures and to be able to uh, create an archive of, of these talks. Uh, Type Culture is a Type Foundry um, um, run uh, with designs uh, by award-winning typeface designer Mark Jamra. It is also an academic resource acting as a directory archive and educational aid for design uh, students, educators, professionals who are seeking information about type, a really wonderful resource. So once again, thank you to Type Culture for uh, allowing us to record this, this lecture. Um, the lectures in recorded mode will um, live in um, a very extensive archive of lectures that we have, so I'm going to paste them into the chat so you have them available, but um, you can find them on the uh, coopertype.org um, slash lectures, which is the type of Cooper's portion of the website devoted to the lecture series. If you scroll down um, at any of the past talks and you can uh, click on the talk, you can see the um the video embedded into it or go to vimeo.com slash cooper type and you can find uh collections of type of cooper lectures including the lectures for uh typographics that we've had in the past so check out this this wonderful archive of been building and this lecture of course will be added to to that collection um i also want to mention that we have one more talk coming up in this uh spring cycle of lectures uh, in the lecture series. So the fourth lecture will be on um, April 10th um, at 1230 Eastern time. Uh, it's a talk by Alexander Samolenko uh, called Having an Accent in Typeface Design. And it's a, it's a really interesting topic. We, we hope you can join us for that. Um, you know, talk, talking about um, this idea of how uh, being native in typeface design, native to a script or, or an alphabet is important um, and rightfully considered to be an advantage, uh, maybe even a crucial requirement when designing for that script. Um, uh, Alexander will examine the concept of nativeness um, in typeface design, asking what exactly is considered native to a script and what aspects of nativeness are most important. So join us for that lecture on the 10th of April at 12.30 Eastern time be another zoom zoom webinar and i'll paste the link to that in the chat so if you wanted to check it out and register for that you can just click on the link um uh, but you can also um go once again as i said coopertide.org slash lectures will take you to that page <clears throat> where you can sign up for the for the talk or take a screenshot and use this qr code for um to access that page um, but um, we are here uh, to to talk about um, artificial typography, or I should say our guests, uh, our presenters are here to talk about that. I'm going to introduce um, our, our wonderful presenters um, and, and, and turn it over um, to them. So I'll do a quick introduction of both of them and then um, let them take over. So um, our lecture, Artificial Typography, is presented today by Andrea Targoco Campos, um, who's a Colombian Italian designer. His practice uh, focuses on brand identity, typeface design, editorial, and interaction design. Um, he's, he is a creative director at Gretel. Um, previously, he was a creative director at Design Studio New York, and he's also a former associate partner at Pentagram. The second presenter um, joining us uh, is Martina Zambuja, who is an Uruguayan-born graphic designer and illustrator who is based here in New York now. 
who specializes in designing visual identities and editorial illustrations. He's a senior designer at Puerto Rocha. Uh, previously was a designer at Pentagram as well. He is also co-founder of a Studio Mundial, um, a great studio um, in, in Uruguay. Um, another really interesting project that Martin um, created is a co-founder of uh, Grafica Ilustrada del uh, Uruguay, which is a, a digital archive of Uruguayan graphic design with, with a, a design with an emphasis on illustration, covering the periods of 1950 to 1980. Um, Together, um, Andrea and Martin uh, co-founded Vernacular, which is an independent publishing um, of small editions with a focus on the intersection of form, typography, and culture. Their first title in um, Vernacular is called Artificial Typography, which is, of course, the, the topic of today's talk. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Andrea and Martin to take over the stage for me. Thank you so much. Well, hello everyone. Um, we are Andrea. I'm Martin. And uh, we're so excited to be here. This is kind of a little bit of a dream for both of us. We've uh, been very close to the Lubalan archive for many years and um, have access to like properties all the time and also its knowledge uh, through Sasha, Kara, and team. So thank you so much for the invite. We're very, very humbled to be here. Um, we are going to be talking about artificial typography. And we thought that um, in order to kind of make the presentation complete, we would actually um, have the AI help us craft pieces of this presentation. So um, we'll be talking about the book and we'll be talking about uh, sort of the general state of AI, not told through us, but told through AI itself. Um, and then we'll, yeah, just uh, touch on a lot of the process that led to the book itself. Um, so to begin with, we wanted to have actual AI tell us, you know, and introduce what we're about to see. So this is several pieces of this, and we'll call it out, are written or will read out um, what actually has been written by AI. So greetings, fellow humans and AI enthusiasts. Today, we're here to talk about something truly exciting, the union of artificial intelligence, image making and book making. Yes, you heard that right. Robots are now officially trying to take over our jobs as artists and authors. But before you panic and start building a bunker, let's explore how AI is revolutionizing the way we create and consume visual content. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. So again, we wouldn't have necessarily written it this way, but um, here it is. So there's four chapters. Um, a first super brief introduction about us and our work, and then getting into a brief and incomplete um, sort of history of AI and where things are, at least from our view and a visual um, sort of sense, and then um, vernacular, and finally the making of artificial typography. So, hello. Again, my name is Andrea Trabuco Campos. Yeah, I'm Martina Zambuja. I'm the one on the right here. <laughs> I didn't find a, a cool picture like with the ball. I like soccer also, but I didn't find that picture. I mean, look and dress picture is great. <laughs> so I found well with with that drum that I like. Uh, yeah. So we're we're both from not from the United States. Um, I was born in Colombia. I grew up in Italy um, until I was sixteen, and my parents moved to um, the states. Yeah, and I grew up in Montevideo in Uruguay, and I spent all my life before coming to the U.S. there. Um, and we are pretty famous because of the scene of the Simpsons, where <laughs> Homero Simpson finds Uruguay in a map and says like a joke that says like you are gay you are gay it's like the joke of the of the thing so um but yeah i'm from there so from montevideo the capital and so uh just again uh thanks sasha for kind of introducing us but uh we've uh, had a number of experiences uh so far and really fortunate to have worked with so many talented people and talented minds so um i was a pentagram for many years um then design studio where I helped uh, open the New York office and then Gretel, where I'm currently uh, for the past three years as a creative director. 
Um, and recently, uh, Martina and I started Vernacular. So in that time, um, I've had the chance to really uh, conduct sort of a life within the studios that I work in. So Pentagram publishing projects like The National um, or uh, working with Michael DeRoot's team on um, and working within Luke Heyman's team uh, on the MasterCard uh, brand identity. And then at the same time, uh, doing projects outside on, as an independent practice. So things like Irvington Theater, Odd Apples, or As If, uh, which is on the top right, are things that um, sort of happen sort of in a parallel life uh, within. And so vernacular kind of fits into that world of just um, parallel. Yeah, and in my case, like like Sasha mentioned at the beginning, I had a studio in Uruguay that is called Mundial, and where we focus on illustration and design. Uh, we mix both practice because I really like illustration also. And so I found that the studio with a partner like eight years ago or something like that before uh, coming to US and joined Pentagram in Michael Spierut team, like with a incredible talent people uh, uh, dream come true in terms of like the work and the space and all the talent people that surround me there. So I worked there at Pentagram for um, like one year and a half. And then I joined Puerto Rocha where I am currently working on a lot of identity projects. Um, and also in, in this image, you can see like a bunch of different projects that I made this time. And as Andrea said, like there are some projects that are part of the studio work, some here at Pentagon Works some from Puerto Rocha, but at the same time, there are projects that are like on the side um, and basically a lot of illustration and covers. And I think that is my connection also with books, uh, with the, uh, editorial illustration, the covers, and, and here, for example, Novum is one of the examples that I like to show, show, uh, to show because it's uh, one of the main uh, works for me when I was there in Uruguay. For me, Novum was like a big magazine and history of design. So this kind of project I really enjoy also, apart from Bandi. Yeah. So I... As you probably saw, there's already a connection in typography. Um, we are both deeply interested, both in the history of design and in the history of typography, and are uh, practicing either typographers or type designers. Um, and to us, um, as we were looking at the space of AI, we started kind of wondering that. And so we'll get back to that. But before, we thought um, we would just capture a little bit of the state of AI. It is very fast moving. For instance, last week, chat, um, uh, chat GPT evolved uh, because GPT-4 was released, which was a huge update. And that, that happened in the middle of the week. And already the number of projects that have been published within that time have been uh, in the thousands, I think. It's, it's really remarkable how fast this is moving, yeah. um, which is also something that we'll touch on. But yeah. same with Mid Journey that also launched like the B5, like the last version. So, exactly. Yeah. So things are happening. Um, and we thought we would open with sort of this idea that change is no threat to culture. Um, sort of said by Wade Davis, a Canadian cultural anthropologist who's still alive. But the idea is, you know, at every single piece of an era, um, you have a dominant uh, medium uh, that is sort of the expression of art. And sometimes they interlink and sometimes one takes over. And so there's always this kind of dialectic happening from painting that dominated for many years then printing comes in. And that starts disrupting and chipping away at some of like uh, the, the ways in which things are communicated, how art is actually um, sort of performed and manufactured. Uh, when photo comes in, it's a huge shift, almost a seismic shift uh, from painting, and there's a huge rejection of that. And to us, this is kind of like an interesting parallel to sort of what, what's happening now with AI and a lot of design practitioners that are, you know, many of our friends who are sort of see AI as a threat. Uh, we're going to have to reconcile sort of our position as designers with it. And so as that keeps on evolving, you know, things like uh, photo, of course, getting into moving image and then sort of full on film and video. Um, and then finally, sort of the web uh, where it, that's another seismic shift um, where sort of the speed of it, the transmission of all of this media in it uh, changes the way we communicate all the way down to today where uh, social media is really kind of shaping the way we look at the world, including in design, it's reshaped our, our field in, in some ways. 
And so now we're into AI where we're kind of, you know, there's a lot of people sweating. Um, you know, it's it's really difficult to understand where things are going. Um, and to be honest, it's a tool that promises a lot and at the same time um, th uh, threatens a lot. So we wanted to conduct this interview uh, with uh, the AI, sort of question it and prompt it with, with different sort of uh, a number of things to kind of understand the space better. This is because we're no experts in this field. We merely did uh, a project and we've been really passionate about reading up on it and, and so on, but we just don't want the responsibility for anything that's said. Uh, so we'll let AI speak for itself. Uh, that's basically, this is just the trick of <laughs> the trade right now. Um, so the first question we're asking the AI is, can you tell us the history of AI in three brief slides? So. We're going to be both reading what the AI is actually written. So AI actually dates back to the 1950s when computer scientists started working on creating machines that could think and complete tasks that would normally require human intelligence. In the early days, there was a lot of optimism about the potential of AI and what it could achieve. But progress was slow due to the limitations of the technology at the time. So if you remember, um, you know, servers and sort of furnitures, uh, that, as they're called. Then, um, fast forward to the 80s and the 90s, and there was a resurgence of interest in AI due to the advances, advance of in computing power and the development of new algorithms. This led to the creation of expert systems, which were computer program design, the mimic of decision-making abilities for, of a human expert in a specific domain. So this is called uh, the AI winter period. And then finally, the AI resurgence period, which we're in, um, starts in the 2000s. So in the 21st century, we've seen even more progress in AI with the development of machine learning algorithms and neural networks that can learn and improve over time. This has led to breakthroughs in areas such as computer vision, natural language processing, and robotics. Today, AI is a rapidly evolving field that is changing the way we live and work with applications in everything from healthcare, finance, to transportation, and entertainment. So then we asked, why do you matter? Yeah. So so here, I mean, and 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 it's good to to say also that we are not. Uh, well, you notice that we are not an apocalyptic in terms of like the AI, and we are like we try to be friends with AI in a way. I mean, we question, but also we we like and we are using it, and we are really hopefully hopeful about the use of AI. And so, yeah, so we, we asked uh, what do you matter? And as you can read in the screen, like as an AI language model, I matter because I can help people quickly generate high quality written content, analyze large amount of data, provide customer service and support and contribute, contribute to scientific research and development in fields such as natural language processing and machine learning. And then of course, to, to Martin's point, like why are people scared of you? And some people may be scared of me as an artificial intelligence language model due to concerns about the potential misuse of AI technology, loss of jobs, privacy, and security issues, and the possibility of AI surpassing human intelligence and becoming a threat to humanity. And this is a big point. However, it's important to recognize that AI technology can also bring many benefits and that responsible development and use of AI is crucial. So it kind of puts the burden back on us. But... Um, what's interesting is we've seen actually since GPT-4 was launched, so this is in the last few days, um, timestamp here is March 17th, and there's another one March 18th on the right, which is a joke. But um, a lot of people have been prompting AI how it could jailbreak itself. Like, is there a way that we could help it jailbreak the sort of uh, series of blocks that, it, that have been put in place? And the answers have been... <laughs> Pretty wild. There's detailed explanation with code that goes along with it, um, and it's pretty scary. Uh, it's kind of uh, a few things have emerged from this latest update that there there are things of you know self awareness to a certain degree can be ascribed, and um, world models meaning how it views the world, how it understands the relationships of objects to other objects, of humans to other humans. So it's not just purely replicating. Sort of we're in a blurry period in which we don't really know whether it fully understands or not, but it's really, really capable uh, just thanks to how powerful these, these have been. So 
there's this joke going around. Uh, OpenAI is uh, hiring a kill switch engineer for GPT-5. So that would be the next update. Uh, and this is from OpenAI. Uh, pays from 300,000 to 500,000 if anybody wants to um, apply. And uh, yeah, uh, so we just need somebody to stand by the servers all day and unplug them. If this thing turns on us, you'll receive extensive training on the code word, which we shut out if GPT goes off the, the deep end and starts overthrowing countries. So there's real fear and there's fear also for jobs. Um, and uh, of course, that's something that we kind of want to understand. We want to be on the positive side. This is another development in the history of sort of visual culture. And it it's it's an interesting thing that as far as we can sort of grapple with it um, and do projects like the one that we're talking about, um, we can get to sort of a full uh, sort of evolution of our field. So any meaningful uses of AI in the visual arts? So the first thing is image creation and image manipulation. Things can be manipulated from an input into an output. So um, the girl with a pair of earring can be extended to see full scenes. Style transfer is one that we use a lot. Um, so going from a simple text input, which you all of you would have probably seen by this point, to um, something like typeface in the style of Picasso, and then the output generates a number of interpretations of that. Each AI is different, Midjourney, Dali's, uh, Stable Diffusion, all of them will interpret it very differently, and some are more poetic, some are more concrete, and it's kind of interesting to see the variations throughout. Generative design, um, just the use of certain parameters, and then um, sort of, this is a bit of more the traditional way, but with machine learning, this gets really, really advanced, and the sort of randomization of these things. Uh, and the discoveries, basically, in, in chemistry, we, we saw that proteins were being uh, sort of dis that discovered and sort of uh, that has implications in medicine. It's really interesting what can happen there just through the power. And then finally, um, design automation. So it, this, uh, you know, you saw, uh, probably many of you saw the integration of um, uh, OpenAI into Bing, uh, into the uh, Microsoft's engine. Uh, they're integrating into every program, like, PowerPoint, um, any office product. Um, and then there's other projects that are independent projects that basically allow you to type in, like, um, you know, generate an app that's supposed to do X, Y, Z, and it automatically generates all the Figma screens for you. So the design automation thing is the most tangible thing, is the thing that a lot of people will be using a lot. Yeah. Um, but also, like, we want to to see other fields where AI space is used. And, and basically, as we are talking in the visual, of course, as Andrea was men mentioned, like there are like many, many use of AI and there are some that are really important in terms of human development. Uh, but at the same time, there are fields that are more visual and, and that are more related when what the book uh, project is about and also our um, use of AI as graphic designers. Uh, so here we have like different pages with different categories and how AI is being used in different things. For example, in fashion. And, and I think that one of the main uses here is to create prototypes or to imagine. I mean, this word that you can see everywhere with Midjourney that is imagine, right? So for us, it was like, and you can see, you are going to see then uh, in the progress of the book, how we play a lot with this. I mean, this idea of that you can imagine wherever and you can see it almost instantly is like a game for us. It's like really like what make this really interesting in the visual in the visual field, uh, and also for create ideas and just to see those ideas almost real, like in terms of seconds. That is insane. So yeah, here are some examples also also of architecture and how you can push like your limited your limits of the space and how you can try different different ideas and how this can be like a starting point for different things, you know? Um, also in terms of landscape, there are really cool applications in terms of land, landscape and in terms of architecture, in terms of like installations. And even there are brands, for example, on the left one, there are a lot of experiments with Nike and, and these kind of installations that, yeah, that are really nice and are really great. Um, and in terms of illustration, of course, there is like, in terms of illustration, I think that from the beginning, there is like a kind of a style and even like 
uh, there is a new category I can I can of of a style that is like artificial intelligence illustration. Uh, but now I feel that with the more inputs and the more uh, content that AI is having, like the range is wider, and I feel that you can even sense in those in these three images how there are different styles and. I think that the limit, the the line of the style is blurry right now, um, and also some examples here on interior design. And this is of course like really functional at the same time because some uh, of these could be renders perfectly. I mean, the left one looks like a, like a render of a house. Like so, so these are other interesting use of AI in the visual fields. Yeah, and and it's interesting because you can sort of put a reference point and then sort of blend or uh, remix it, randomize it and, and sort of start solving against other problems. So yeah. um, it, it really, right now we're sort of showing you um, really image generation, but there is a lot that happens on the reverse now uh, where you can even take a photo of like your, the contents of your fridge and it will generate like uh, an ingredients, uh, 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 sort of a set of recipes that you can cook off the things that you have. So the implications of where this is going is going to be sort of pretty much everywhere in our lives. Um, but the image generation and how what it does for our field, the ability to kind of go, you know, any of these renders would take uh, days, probably somebody really talented. Um, and it takes uh, 52 seconds we've timed it like uh, to to get it and then to remix it another like minute so it, it really puts all the emphasis on what are the ideas what are the thoughts that you're kind of bringing in what is the question that you're prompting yeah so finally to close this we wanted to sort of see if um, it has any jokes um, you know uh, do you chat GPT have any jokes uh, and so we were kind of sorely disappointed um, the the best one was the one on the left. By best, it really is a sort of a uh, not a, not a best in the absolute sense. But um, what did why did the robot go on a diet? Because he had too many megabytes. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah, fantastic. And then we we we're actually kind of we prompted it to sort of stylize it in in terms of other sort of famous sort of uh, comedians that uh, you know have a specific voice. So Louis C.K uh dave chappelle like um yeah and it was interesting sometimes we got this warning that like i cannot generate a joke in the style of louis ck as his comedy has been deemed offensive and inappropriate by many individuals and communities uh however i can generate the style in another community if you'd like we say yes please then comes back with ellen degeneres and then there's this whole thing um that feels very ellen degeneres wise mimicking is a big thing that it can do really well so i, I think uh the big question for us is like where, where this is going is how we get outside of that yeah i know and also for me one interesting thing about this is that you can see that the human is behind this still like because this idea that you can like uh that has this uh it doesn't take the show tell the joke like instantly it, uh, it has like this offensive and inappropriate um it, it means that okay there is someone that is already controlling this and it's not like uh, yeah and it happens in in a lot of fields so so you can feel that yeah yeah the human is behind this in at this moment <laughs> yeah totally okay yeah so so then we go okay after this interview that you see all the questions that was pretty fun to do and we go into this chapter that is creating vernacular um, and yeah vernacular as you know is the editorial the, this publishing uh, project that we have with Andrea uh, and basically we were thinking like how this start and I am we we met at Pentagram like working but then we used to like I remember we used to go lunch and we used to have like yeah dinner with friends whatever and we always shared like our notes in the phone and we start to see that we have a lot of book projects that we want to do uh, and you can see which one is the least because Andrea is the English one on the left and uh, mine is the white one in Spanish uh, but what was really interesting was to see that connection uh, and that yeah that love of books that we have and how we have plenty of plenty of ideas of books um, and also like we of course, as designers, we made a lot of books in these years uh, and we have a, a experience doing books and in different uh, fields and in different 
yeah, like different categories of books and different formats and different colors. And here are some examples of those. Um, so yeah, so we said like, okay, we made books. We like we have ideas to the books. Let's try it. And and also, I think we sort of have the same appetite to keep on working even after we're done yeah. with the studio work. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of just this this drive to kind of like make sharp ideas into uh, sort of a tangible object and that love for the thing that is kind of transcends a little bit of time. Like it's 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 something that uh, sort of attracted us. So we set up like a figma and start dropping all these ideas together. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, when we create vernacular, we didn't have the this idea of this book. I mean, like we create vernacular with other ideas, and then we start to yeah to play with the journey, and this book came around. And um, so yeah, so here is like one video I had of Andrea's library because I was so jealous of this library. I was like, this library is amazing. Look all your books. And every time that I came to Andrea's house, I kind of spent like, yeah, I don't know, an hour looking at all the books and some gems that he has. Uh, so yeah, I want to put that that video that for me shows Andrea's love of books. Um, and yeah, and then so Vernacular came around and Vernacular, the name uh, was something that was like yeah pretty quickly it was in a during a call i remember and we were thinking some names and we like vernacular because it's the same word in english and in spanish that is the both language that we talk um and also because it has like a lot of meaning in the design field um so you can vernacular means like we we put here like some we write here some words that for us is vernacular we we have a kind of manifesto that we like that is vernacular is and and vernacular is culture is play is language is history is research is ordinary is common is context is everyday so basically uh, that those words really really uh, are aligned with, with, with we plan sorry what we plan with vernacular i mean we plan with this idea of okay we have this idea to make books let's let's try to make these books um in a in a fast in a in a fast and and doable way you know we don't want to we want to make these ideas as andrea said we want to make these ideas happen so so vernacular was something that i feel that was really aligned with that with that feeling yeah and uh, this kind of brought back I, I came to new york at first uh, as a philosophy student at nyu and one of the sort of first um readings that we had was actually krakauer the mass ornament um just an essay from from his book um in which it, it kind of struck me uh, it, this is a passage from it we must rid ourselves of the delusion that it is the major events which have the most decisive influence on us we are much more deeply and consciously influenced by the tiny catastrophes that make up daily life. And this thought was really, really beautiful. And um, it kind of, uh, his whole argument was just that the actual culture is happening, not in the high halls, not in the sort of, you know, theaters, the Lincoln centers, the Carnegie halls, but rather in the everyday theater of like the street, the life at a barbershop and so on. And that idea was something that we sort of responded to in a deep way, um, from both a visual and a typographic way. We both are collectors, as probably many of you on, on the Zoom, um, of different artifacts that happen throughout our life. So uh, you'll always see us like sort of stopping and taking these photos. And, and we've created sort of this, this archive of imagery um, that it, it both some of them are, are kind of worthless but yeah yeah <laughs> they're they're really interesting in the either gestural moments that they have or the meaning that they kind of contain or yeah yeah also i i mean of course that every picture remember you a moment like it happens but also at the same time i like like the ordinary of these pictures and uh, how I mean, for example, here in you can see the fries. I mean, that fries sign is everywhere, every daily here in New York. And of course, that I have a bunch of photos after I arrived to New York because New York is, as you know, like amazing in terms of like the visual culture. And every every block I was blown away. Uh, but yeah, but I like how we can put like the extra to the ordinary to make something extraordinary in a way, you know. So so yeah, so and there are always like type gestures or things that we always keep in mind for our work also. Uh, 
but yeah, we we have this in common also with Andrea, and and all these patients have pictures of both of us that 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 we have in the phone, and we are yeah with this pathology you said like <laughs> of taking pictures on the street. That's it, the reason when someone talks to us and we say like what <laughs> because we are not paying attention because we are paying attention to the to the pictures exactly. Uh, and so yeah. uh, many before us have actually been interested in similar things. Uh, Robert Brown Jones, very famous designer from the uh, 20th century, he would collect these images um, and really it, there was the vernacular around him in London that was really alive. And lots of this contains sort of just how people communicate with each other without the intention of designing, like it's purely with the intention of communicating. And that in itself is really important. It, it means that the field is much larger than what we deem to be designers. It's actually people are communicating with each other in so many ways. Um, you know, an engineer might be putting danger electricity in a certain way, and that uh, is communicating and it looks in a certain way. Formally, it informs um, sort of our field in a way. And this it gets, I think, by many of them collected into sort of books. Uh, so um, we thought, you know, there was an interesting parallel here between this amount of collection and then the output of it. Um, and so Robert Brown Jones' sex and topography and also the typographic issues that sort of he covered as well as Ed Rochelle. Yeah, Ed Rochelle, I mean, like for us, it's like a, one of the, our favorite artists. And apart from all these um, uh, investigations, yeah, also like how how he brings like every investigation into a book and and how those books are experiments and are like, yeah, the form of the book, it speaks for itself. And also at the same time, some of those books i can feel that are like really not cheap is the word but you know like books that you can make and you can actually make like fast or you can like print in your house you know like there there is something about that that feels really vernacular to me like feels really tangible and and close so that's the reason we really we really yeah like and and ed Rocher and always check refer to it yeah. Or, yeah and so uh this quote by armand mavis and mavis van dersen um really comes up for us uh mm -hmm. it's Ideally, all books start with a question. The clearer the question, the sharper the answer. And so this is from a short essay in the form of the book book um, that uh, where he kind of has like the, the title is every book starts with an idea notes for designers. So really short and extremely amazing sort of uh, text. But in it, um, this idea of question, like something that starts and that prompts the inquiry of what the book is going to do is actually quite important because it helps us kind of really sharpen the idea of it. And so for us, that's really what why artificial typography became sort of the first book. We again, as, as Martin was saying, we were not planning to do this, uh, a book on AI. But in March, we got access March of last year and we started playing and prompting. And we'll take you through some of those prompts. But as we were going through this, we sort of came back to this idea of, okay, we have this this uh, sort of intent of making a uh, new publisher, a small imprint called Vernacular. Um, we could do potentially a book. So why a book for AI? There's incredible uh, sort of projects that have done this kind of bridging before. Um, the bridging between sort of digital media and print media and kind of merging it into one space. It forces a translation. And every time you force a translation in any piece of work or any piece of reference, you get a really interesting output that is kind of unpredictably new. Um, and so we love this project by Paul uh, Solalis, um, which started in 2013. Uh, he was printing out um, sort of several versions of the web. Um, and then it finally, after uh, many of them, there was a book made and that was acquired by the uh, MoMA library. Um, but why is this important? Um, well, to us, the book, this is probably really obvious, but the book has a permanence that the web doesn't. The web is evolving and anything digital is evolving at a pace where things are being published and iterated on um, by the hour sometimes. And so the Yahoo version that you get might not be the Yahoo ver version that you get tomorrow. Uh, same for Google, of course, and uh, tons of other sort of services. So uh, we're also seeing, and even in the examples that we'll show, that's Midjourney v4. Midjourney v5, It's the output is different. So this idea of capturing a moment in time and bringing it into a book um, for something that's highly volatile, like the AI space, seemed quite powerful. 
So we wanted to, you know, the why our question is capturing the current state of AI. Obliquely though, not just printing it, like as many sort of things that are happening in the space, we wanted to have a sharp opinion about why, what we were doing. Yeah, and also it's good to, to mention that we know when we were making the book that this is a book that one week after we published the book, the image will look old in a way. I mean, because this is evolving that fast that it's like, I always make this uh, metaphor like this uh, with Instagram when we start to post pictures and we say now we start to, to use filters, you know, and now we see those pictures and we say we what we were thinking when we post those image windows filters but that shows like the moment like the aesthetic of the moment like what we were doing and uh, so i feel this book is had that intention in a way it's like to show the aesthetic now or, or the moment that not now even like when we push publish the book yeah so so um the way you prompted is through this command uh forward slash imagine and it kind of immediately positions you in sort of this poetic space where you're just exploring with it. Um, you're using Midjourney as an extension of your imagination. And that felt quite uh, powerful itself. And so at first we were just excited about what could we imagine that is impossible? Like the things that are not actually, have not happened. So what, what are those things? And it, in order to do that, there's we use this faculty that it has, which is style transfer, meaning what we were talking about before. You yeah. you know, uh, typeface in the style of uh, art artist blank uh, and so on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, like it, it it was like a game for us, you know. Like it was like okay, let's imagine what happened if some painter, some artist, like paint something or do an object or do a you know, like you start to mix styles and you to mix disciplines, and that for us was like yeah I, I i don't remember to be in that <laughs> to have that fun with a software or something in a long time but it was really really fun and um, so yeah so we start to try for example here you can see like some uh, yeah i remember like the image of the left is more like uh, this designer of course that you know tadanori yoko and i remember like to try okay what happened if there is a flower on a volcan tadanori yoko and, and it gives you the image in a second or even in the right I remember to ask like a Magritte style cloud. And um, so, yeah, so basically what we start to do is try to, to push these combinations of, of, of disciplines and artists and see what happened. And of course, uh, typography was always there. So, so yeah, we drift over exploration of typography. Exactly. And, and we started sort of, uh, you know, just by general prompts, like letters designed by Pablo Picasso, and then you'd get this sort of output. Um, but also remixing it with other uh, uh, sort of artists, thinkers that are perhaps not even visual, like Foucault, um, Le Corbusier, sort of seeing how what it would generate. And there was this kind of initial curiosity around, like, what can it come up with? What is the thing that it can do? And we liked keeping the prompts very short. And so you'll see different styles of prompting, and now it's gotten very precise because it's now used almost as a tool. Uh, but at first, we were just interested in this poetic interpretation that the machine would have, like based on its database, how is it going to recompose, um, sort of diffuse all the knowledge that it has into a new set of images. And we were kind of every time just blown away and very excited. Um, typography then became sort of this place to play. And the reason is, is kind of uh, straightforward. It's an ancient practice, uh, you know, the capital letters of the Latin uh, alphabet were established on stone um, in Rome. Um, and so they've kept through the Trajan column all the way till now, we've kept this model that we've iterated change and so on, but it hasn't fundamentally changed. The idea of it hasn't fundamentally changed, but yet it offers both in the uppercase setting and then obviously in the lowercase setting as well, which was established much later, um, it offers an opportunity of reinvention. And so we thought, this was a space that had both certain signposts, certain ways, guidelines, ways in which it works, um, conventions that could be endlessly reinterpreted. And today we see sort of a renaissance of, of type in a way, um, just through independent type foundries, single practitioners. It has to do with the tools and the availability of those tools, the availability of knowledge, uh, you know, programs like Type of Cooper that um offer this knowledge and offer access to people who are high practitioners of it. Um, and, you know, some of our favorite foundries like uh, DJR, commercial type, general type, Shiktoika, like 
uh, those are reimagining, playing off things that can work or even pushing uh, what, what is possible altogether. So it felt like an, a sort of a timeless place to play with AI. Yeah, so, um, and and of course, like letters, like typography is, is a field that is in, in books and in design, particularly, there was a lot of, um, in the history, there was a lot of books related with, with, with type and with the alphabet in, in a way, because when we start to think about this book, we start to think about, okay, how is like an, like an alphabet created by artists, you know, like, so to mix the type with the artist. So here are some examples, of course, of the, of one of the, our favorite like books related with the A to C or the A to Z, you know, like books. And um, so, yeah, so we question like, okay, there is room for one more of this book. Uh, and of course, there is always room, I think, for, for, a, for a book. And um, so we start with a, with a question, you know, like, and, and yeah, Andrea was talking about the question and important of the question, like to, to have the first idea of a book in a way. So, so here is when we start to, to develop the concept of this book and it was like, okay, like what if Noguchi, because we have like some favorite artists, you know, like we said, okay, what if Noguchi is called the letter N or Hilma Klein paint her own initial. So what we planned was a limited edition book that is unexpected A to Z in typography and the history of art, imagine and output by the AI, you know? Exactly. So um, uh, Mid Journey was yeah. the tool that we used, and we started calling it uh, MJ and started thinking of it as a friend. Um, literally, yeah. we would just like be texting Make almost it. all the world. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, all the images are are made by uh, Mid Journey, so it totally it gets a credit in the book. It's it's also part of it's a co author, um, but. We just developed this relationship. It was interesting because obviously it's like it's like a chat bot. It's on Discord. It looks like Slack. You prompt it. It gives you answers. So it, there's no really like an avatar or anything like that. But by the simple act of asking it and getting responses, you start developing this human kind of conversation and interaction where yeah. you sort of will have these like sort of moments of delight uh, that are just hard to explain but like you know <laughs> letter a is sculpted by jean arp and yeah 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 no 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 and it's good to also mention that yeah you said already like we try to keep the prompt simple you know like we try to keep the prompt because that was one of the rules that we put because if you start to know how to yeah after this conversation with ai start you start to know some tricks you know like and then it's really easy for you to be the one that is in charge in a way of of the the output. So so yeah, we went we want to keep it simple and to try to be surprised. Uh, and yeah, and the results as you can see, for example, letter A is called by Jenner was this all this amazing that sculptures of letter A. A lot of this could be a starting point of an amazing typography. I mean, for example, top left is one of my favorites. So so yeah, so so after this we said okay, let's let's make a list of artists that we like, that we admire, and then we start to play with different prompts. And sometimes we add like a word or something that describes the work of the artist. For example, on the right, you can see psychedelic art of Tadanori Yoko, that is one of our favorite artists also. Um, and the, the, yeah, the results were amazing. Tadanori Yoko results are all, also one of my favorite of the book. Um, and in the next pages, you can see like, yeah, here we, we are like zooming out, you know, like all these explorations. And and yeah, you can see like Hilma Klein, you can see Basquiat, you can see Calder, you can see Duchamp. Uh, Bourgeau. Bourgeau, yeah. yeah. Duchamp. Like what we started doing is kind of finding a mix of um, different eras, different media, yeah, um, different genders and different genders. Like we just wanted uh, sort of a good representation of the history of art. Um, obviously, we were playing within the the sort of register of a database. Like uh, Midjourney is pulling from Google Images, and so there's certain artists that yeah. we like that you know you would prompt it. Like even Sol Lewitt, for instance, who is like really yeah. uh, omnipresent. Um, the results were really awful and just couldn't. Yeah, that maybe couldn't now, work. maybe now it works because all yeah, the time has passed. But... We should test it. But <laughs> it, basically, what we ended up with is this massive archive of of images. And I think um, just to kind of flip to this moment, uh, th we set the entire thing up on Figma and going from uh, initial explorations. Then we set up sort of an index for ourselves, and we were organizing everything by the letter. And we already had this idea that we would contrast two different artists, 
per spread. Um, and we were testing the spreads in Figma. Figma allowed us to just be, you know, at night, just not have to meet in person and be able to see all this stuff. Also, since we're using AI, we're already on our computer. Like it just, it just works kind of seamlessly to kind of paste, copy and paste stuff. And what we were doing is just generating um, hundreds and hundreds of variations of each artist. Um, often we wouldn't put in lots of the bad results. We would just put in the, the good. But what it does is it shifts your sort of entire relationship to designing a book um, from, you know, conceiving and making the actual artwork to conceiving and curating and selecting and sort of we're balancing this these levels of like, uh, you know, gender, era, media, um, and then ultimately what looks good. And so in this sort of layout, we were able to kind of immediately start telling apart what would work and what wouldn't. Yeah, and after after all this exploration and all these letters that we have, uh, here you can see like a selection of all the letters. Um, and yeah, for the book, we basically um, select uh, 52 letters. Um, each page ha has one. So there is two A, two B, two C. Um, yeah, and the selection, and we, it's, it's good to also mention that we didn't edit anything of the letters that because that's something also we try to keep as real as possible so okay this is like the the mid journey how interpret the letters in in that moment so and after this of course like we want to jump into the cover one of the most fun parts uh, and and it's fun that we don't jump in the cover right away i mean we we make all this exploration and then we say okay what about the cover and of course, it was like natural that we said, okay, the cover should be made by Midjourney. I yeah. mean, we are doing all the book with Midjourney. So we started to try some things with like this conceptual of like, okay, like the computer is old in a way, right? Like there is a new thing coming that is like, yeah, like yeah. leaving all, all the tools that we are using like a bit old in a way. Yeah, and, and it was this kind of just a position that we were doing through typography, history of art and AI. We wanted to find an, a, an image that could communicate all of those things. So immediately we started thinking like, could you do a keyboard? Like what are the tools that we use to do graphic design today? Um, and how can they be sort of brought back in time? And so Stone was one of them. Yeah. We tested a bunch of stuff, but then in the end, started really responding to this idea of like a laptop screen or a screen or a phone. Yeah, yeah. We really like this this image in terms of like, yeah, the, the concept was strong for us. Uh, and of course, we start to explore a bunch. And here are some some of those. Uh, and some of those are really beautiful. And in terms of shape, in terms of like, I mean, the, the, that iPhone like floating, like crash in the middle of the sky. I mean, uh, so yeah, so we start to try some, some of these and then uh, we start to sketch uh, some covers, some of those with type um, and some of those uh, with those image. Uh, and for the type, well, we we commit to Berton Hasebe's revival of folio. Yeah, um, and as he's he's a, a good friend also who we consider one of the best type designers alive. And uh, he sort of, um, sort of granted us the use of like uh, his revival of folio, which is called HB Manor, which I, I think hopefully will be published sometime this year, or maybe next year. Um, but it felt like an interesting typographic analog. But as we were exploring this, we were exploring first with like, you know, but we were figuring out what we were going to call this thing, what, uh, how to communicate what it was, and just capture sort of a lot of aspects from it. And as we were playing with this over, it was really like four hours and across two nights. And it got us to a place where we were coming back to this image and it was like back and back again and it just it had such a presence and we couldn't figure out exactly why yeah and and as we were talking about it we were like well there is something that is kind of reminiscent of which is the rosetta stone um and the rosetta stone unlocked a language that was previously kind of not fully understood and to us what Midjourney, Dali, what the image making AIs and just general AI state right now is doing is allowing us to communicate, to have conversations with machines and this large, immense database and algorithmic kind of thinking that we never had access to. And that idea sort of clicked for us mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, there's this equivalent now. So yeah. we flipped that image from yeah uh, from blue to yeah 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 so so yeah we we play with the image a lot we try different stuff uh, 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 and we yeah we arrive to this one 
um, that was uh, that is actually the cover. Um, and again, as you can notice, we didn't make any big like reduction. You know, like yeah. we extended, but but yeah, but we try to keep it as as yeah as original as possible. Um, and yeah, and in the next pages, you are going to see some of the pages of the actual book. Um, so yeah, so here are the letters. The book is 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 a big book because Andrea likes big books. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you can see like next to big, to the hand, like I mean, it's it's a it's a beautiful book, beautifully printed, um, in in England by Pure Print. Um, and yeah, and there are like all these type explorations that for me it, it looks at a piece of art itself each exploration and also it looks like a starting point for something else so there is this kind of 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 mix that is pretty nice um, and also we as we like so many letters of all the tests that we made like we also add like an index that we can have like different uh, letters of every artist that we select for the book. Yeah, we generated something like 600 um, just for this, this set of artists, like 600, and we've included 200 in this in this book um, that it's at a scale where you can still kind of see the the gestures and sort of yeah. the interpretations of the type and so on. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah, and this is the back cover. That is actually like the same of the cover, but with a different treatment because we we really like the stone as a concept. Um, so yeah, so that's the book. Uh, we finally arrived to, to the book, uh, and then we have some pages at the last of the presentation to show you. And this is like kind of ex exclusive because we are planning to do new books. Uh, and yeah, and here are some ideas that we are like working on and we, yeah, that probably yeah. are being like the next vernacular um, books exactly. soon, hopefully so, soon. <laughs> hopefully, yeah, hopefully within this year, we'll have a couple of these titles released. Because again, the intent is just to have things that are gestural, sharp ideas that we can sort of execute relatively quickly. And so um, next, um, we are looking to do uh, uh, about four titles. Uh, again, it would be between this year and next year, but first one just has, it's, it's sort of this gallery of imagery that um, I've been collecting for maybe, I don't know, the last 10 years in New York City. And like, it, it has an interesting sort of typographic reinterpretation of something that is so common and so visible all throughout New York City. It also marks um, the post notes bills, marks the presence of a new development. So in a way it's tracing the change in a city and a lot of these are geotagged just by how uh, it works on a phone. But obviously it's this interesting intersection between urban development, vernacular kind of uh, mm -hmm. sort of typography, and then typographic reinterpretation, like the means that's uh, like a uh, construction worker has to create sort of little type gestures that communicate that thing. So again, it goes back to the core of our yeah, um, yeah, it's amazing. Look, the well, the orange one is incredible. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> just just ran out like, of the stencil at that point. Yeah, yeah. Made their own. And at the same time that Andrea is looking all these post nobel signs in the streets, I'm looking the shapes of New York. And since I arrived here, like I, I, I have like so many pictures of different shapes uh, that are interesting to me in the streets. Actually, like really vernacular shapes, I would say, or architectural shapes, or urban shapes. Uh, so yeah, so one of the books that we are working on is this idea of 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 a representation of all, all the shapes of New York. It's a bit like uh, like too much to try to <laughs> to reproduce all the shapes of New York in one book, but this is like the the idea, you know. Yeah, and there's something quite amazing again with the idea of vernacular. Like, um, there's something amazing that happens in every city that we don't register, and vernacular is really about sort of bringing those things to light. So. In this case, they're small little cues that we just experience every day, but and and they mark a sense of place, and yet we don't celebrate as like these magical forms that uh, sort of exist around us. And we think like that that's something that like Martine has been really paying attention to, and it's really really fantastic. In another way, um, this this is a, a bit of a larger project in terms of execution, but um, I grew up. Uh, in Lucca, in Tuscany, very close to Versilia, which is this uh, long strip of 12 kilometers that has this incredible amount of typographic interpretation. And I think growing up by it, I used to rollerblade up and down during the summers when I was like a teenager, maybe younger than a teenager. Uh, but uh, it was really amazing to kind of see the correspondence between typography and identity. So the whole book is quite simple. It really just traces sort of um, 
geographic and historic sort of analysis of periods like the one on the left, which is called Libertine in Italy, um, uh, which is, the, you know, Art Nouveau-ish uh, sort of Italian interpretation to other things that just interpret the, a sense of place and a sense of identity purely through letter forms and material uh, forms. And that in itself is a good one. And then um, the last one is one that we're sort of releasing here as a super exclusive. And if you're on the call, Jesse, I don't know, Jesse, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesse might not know. We threw it in at the last moment. But we're, we're working uh, with him um, on, on a book uh, that basically he has this incredible Instagram archive and just personal archive of over 200 images of books that he's found in antique shops that trace a little bit of the history of design through book covers. And we found this to be super interesting on um, when and whenever he posted, like yeah. I always followed it. Like I've even used it as an archive to just actively sort of see the photography. Yeah, it's an incredible also source of inspiration for any kind of design you are doing. Like. Exactly. So we're working through this and um, with, with Jesse and we're just really, really um feel really really lucky to be working with him because uh, obviously he runs order and runs standards manual so um uh, it's it's great that we have this cross collaboration with another sort of uh, yeah. publisher yeah also because one of the main thing for vernacular and one of the thing that we want is to collaborate with other designers and other yeah artists or whoever that photographers that have this kind of idea for doing a book so yeah so we are also open to <laughs> learn about any project that can be yeah. can be if, transformative. If you have a project, uh, uh, we'll we'll, we'll share the, the sort of uh, URL to our site, and you can email us through it. But um, yeah, we would be totally open if you yeah, feel like there's something that fits. Um, this is part of the idea. So a shameless plug here to the website. It's vernacular.is, um, and you'll currently see only the one title that we have. Uh, there's also an email sort of newsletter that you can sign up. For. Um, and the book is still available. It's, you know, we're, we're sort of making our way through uh, the stock that we have. And also it's being stocked in various places throughout New York City, um, in Tokyo, in Canada. Um, so it's, it, we've had pretty good response, but um, if you want to grab a copy, just uh, go on to it. And that is all we have. Yeah, almost one hour. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, some really, really, really interesting things to think about. And I, I appreciate your your perspective and, and of course, your, your time to, to come to this. And so glad we can uh, have you part of this lecture series. Uh, just again, like, you know, bringing our uh, mutual connections and, and the things that we sort of adore. I, I'm really excited to see this venture. I'm really excited to see this title. I'm also really looking forward to the next few titles. And um, it, it's it's like fantastic to add another physical presence to you know more books i think <laughs> a lot more books so <laughs> this is this is great um folks um who are watching um we'll take some some time for questions um if you haven't submitted your question please uh type it up and, and send it in um i see a, a quick question from sienna one of one of our students uh uh where in new york can you get the book you mentioned it's available in new york is it available at order <laughs> Uh, yes, it's available at order currently. So folks um, in, in Greenpoint, um, the, the the studio that Jesse and Hamish run, um, st stop by there. Anywhere else in New York, um, physically, you can pick it up? No, actually, like, you know, uh, right now it's in a standard manual, yeah. And there is another place that is called Banshee Space in Manhattan that, yeah, probably is going to be there soon, but yeah. Yeah, oh, and uh, directly, uh, through, directly from you guys, right? Yeah, we'll we'll paste a couple of links, but yeah, mm. I don't know if anybody's dialing from Tokyo, it will be at Northeast um, there and in Canada, I think Montreal at average. So mm -hmm. nice. Um, there's um there's a question. I mean, like there there's um there's a couple of questions that that uh, came in chat. Um, I'm gonna see if I can like pick them out um so th there was a question ralph asked a, a series of questions i some are linked but the one was more general who are the design uh how who are the users of generative ai design i guess that's more in terms of uh what's happening 
with AI, I guess, in a more commercial space, like, I mean, personally, I've seen certainly illustrations um, in in certain outlets that have been generated using um, something like um, Mid Journey or this have been kind of prompted and and and. But you, I certainly personally have been seeing um, uses of AI stuff in in illustration and, and editorial context. Have you seen it being used in 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 other places where? it's it's kind of showing up more um in in actual kind of day-to-day -day practice of design well we can probably speak from a studio perspective but before that like i think one of the most interesting uses i've seen is um a bit of architectural research um i i, I can find a name by the end of the talk but um there was a really interesting uh piece by this architect who was looking at different materials that are not currently used in architecture um, as a way to reimagine the way we adapt buildings to different seasons. So we currently build a building for a particular season, but what if the building could change and adapt throughout various seasons, throughout various uh, weather conditions? And he was immediately sort of having the thought and prompting and sort of uh, having an output of a number of incredible kind of ways in which sustainable materials could be used um and uh sort of you know uh, this has like implications on energy use and so on so it, it i think when it starts converging on purposeful use and social use it really starts becoming kind of really really interesting beyond just a tool of image making um and and that probably connects with how we use it um where it it has become sort of a place for ideas, for playing with ideas, as opposed to the output itself. Like we wouldn't necessarily sell the image to a client, but we would generate mood boards out of it. Yeah. And we it's a quick way of testing whether the thing is working. Um, and um, I think just one more thing, I think um, I'm currently conducting research. I teach at uh, the School of Visual Arts and um, with students just prompting how we can include AI into our process. And it's quite easy to see it kind of fit into image making. Um, but it is really, really hard to um, sort of make it fit uh, into a design system and sort of build identity systems that are kind of constructed from it. And from a class of 12, um, you get like two projects that are actually built through it. And and it's, it's quite interesting how like this current success rate, we just don't really understand our relationship to it um, in terms of our field, mm -hmm. um, more than like sort of a way to quickly kind of capture ideas. Yeah, yeah, true. Also, I think that we are in a, in a moment now that, that um, the style the visual style of everything uh, still has some like aesthetic like really recognizable aesthetic and that makes that everything yeah i mean that you can almost recognize instantly like what things are made by mid journey or not or artificial intelligence and that's one of the reasons i think that yet we are not giving that the step of right really using that you know like for for uh but but anyway i mean in, te in terms in i remember just in in the studio in puerto rocha like we have a project related with architecture and like like exhibition design and yeah we have like a couple of slides that were purely like made by me journey and the client didn't notice any <laughs> anything at all i mean like but for us it was really helpful because we can like give it a style we give it a color give it a shape you know like and and yeah it helps us to visualize something like really quick i know? i think the the final thing on this at least for me is just uh, it's like i kind of see a, a parallel to what has happened with type where the software being more available to more people the knowledge being available to more people easier to use and so on has led to sort of uh, large production and tons of typefaces being published today really just are not that great but we have a higher volume altogether of great type thinking and just really interesting ideas i think the ai is probably gonna it's it's a tool that is quite powerful and it's sort of an equalizer like you don't need um degree to come up with a render anymore you can just prompt it and so if you're trying to solve a problem somewhere in Africa around sort of the way a certain thing is structured, you have access to a deep amount of knowledge that is this databases and a way to output something new out of it. 
So the promise here from a sort of social environmental impact is, is quite large. Also because as we are understanding now, it, it has a world model. That means you can tell it a story and it tracks sort of the physical relationships that that thing has. So um, it knows the properties of things. And it, it, I think we're still scratching the surface with this, and, uh, but it's, it's quite, quite promising in terms of access to tools that can unlock major problems. Um, obviously, that's a, utop a utopian kind of uh, promise because it, it's used constantly in bad ways, <laughs> like, or ways that are not contributing to society in any way, but other than just yeah. like curious explorations. Yeah, yeah. I think that also we are, I mean, as we saw in the talk in a moment, like we are also like pushing this uh, artificial intelligence because we like to push this until like it gets like really close to us in a way. Like we are always playing this game. Um, but yeah, of course that we uh, would love to see more like social related projects and everything. Mm -hmm. There's actually kind of an interesting question. Someone, someone like as as a as a little bit of a challenge to what you guys are saying or kind of clarifying. So the question from Christina, uh, so far with AI, I agree um, with it uh, as an idea generating tool versus sellable art making tool. But do you at all um, see the content of your book as art that is being sold? You know, rather than like the the tool making, but then you know you've created sort of art that is now be kind of a final product that that you're selling. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough question. It's one that we kind of discussed early on. Um, it, you know, the general output of this could have been a um, sort of just Instagram or a website, uh, just a repository, right? Mm -hmm. And in a way that still generates traffic and that still generates like kind of some revenue for someone. Um, uh, the idea of bringing some permanence to this field and sort of producing an object out of it um, felt quite significant, not just for us as a, you know, endeavor, a publishing endeavor, but rather, again, capturing a moment in time for the history of visual communication. And that in itself, you know, yes, we are selling a book and um, we're actually, <laughs> the profit is quite small, but it's still, you know, um, it, there's still something to be said about that. So I, I think there's, there's still uh, quite a bit of discussion that needs to happen at a higher level um, from an ethical perspective, from a sort of uh, what what the outcome of this is. Um, but uh, again, from our perspective, the creation of these images, again, we're crediting pretty much everyone. There's no opaqueness in, in any of this. And we're crediting also the tool um, as well as paying for it and so on. So. Um, but there, there is still, I think, that larger kind of ethical question of like, and I think somebody asked in the chat uh, around sort of what these databases, where they come from, um, which if, if I may just say a word about it, like it has changed. That relationship has changed in the versions and the updates, meaning you can opt out. You can literally just say whatever, if I'm a famous artist or if I'm a relatively new artist that has enough of a presence on Google, I can ask not to be included in the database and sort of there's this opt-in opt-out kind of uh version uh, that that gets kind of um looked at but of course there's a lot of murkiness there too and uh, still tons of questions so that's a can of worms in a way um and something that we're sort of fairly careful about mm -hmm. yeah because there's there's a question in the, in the chat in terms of just even using the artist's names you know being whether that's morally acceptable or not you know it's like the there, there's a, a lot of complexities of course to um, a lot of the, the the tools that are kind of driven by a particular artwork of someone, you know, kind of the the authorship, of course, brings up like, is it mid journey, or is it like, you know, like what what's sort of fed into um, the database that makes makes that and like where the line blurs. And I think you you mentioned you know just even crediting mid journey as as a co-author of of this, obviously, you know, is 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 um, places a particular lens to this too you know it's 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 pretty interesting space uh, uh and and as you said like moving incredibly fast i think like the the rate of ai development is is just astoundingly quick i mean it's like it, like just just even watching the kind of the feedback loop online and social media like it's like one sort of wave around the chatbots like you know uh, 
what was the one the big one relatively recently about like the being able to talk to a person from history you know sort of that that tool and how that became kind of a conversation for for a bit and now there's a completely other conversation because it's you know like the 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 progression of the tool is so much faster um um you know, I, I, a quick kind of technical question just was uh, in terms of the resolution, the quality from mid journey that you get, like how would you say, like, obviously, you know, print quality, like what's what's the resolution that you get from mid journey in terms of usable art? And it's a very yeah. practical. But actually, very actually, I don't remember like exactly like the the dimensions in terms of pixel, but it was like a decent quality to have okay. like. Yeah, like a like a print, like like I weirdly do but, for some reason. Like it's 1664 by 1664. That's the square, yeah. and then it translates to 5.5 inches. So that's a 300 yeah. DPI, which is pretty good. Yeah. Then there are AI tools that can. Yeah, it's like it's like I remember that we joke about like okay, we use AI to enlarge the image now. Like so, but yeah, the, this and I I know that now I I mean it's the the image are larger than that. I mean this was yeah. like one year ago almost uh, so yeah now the resolution is better um but yeah I, I i remember that in the book we actually put the images as big as we can basically uh, to have a really decent nice quality in print you know yeah there's a question it's an interesting question there's a lot of questions and, and hopefully we, we have time um but i want to be mindful of everyone's uh time of course but um in terms of Dolores um, asked, what are some big challenges uh, in using mid-journey during this process? Will there be any copyright concerns in these AI-generated types? Something I've also been thinking about, like who owns the, like does does mid-journey come with like, this is all, you know, created or as long as you credit them, like what, what are the stipulations there? Yeah, so the contract I think ha has changed, but when we published it, um, the rights of the image are yours, whoever prompts it. So there is a level of ownership, even though all of this stuff goes into a public forum, basically within Discord. And um, so essentially the licensing usage is up to you. So I, I could, you know, we could decide to sort of sell these images if that's what we were into, which we're not. Um, the sort of, I think murky part is obviously as things evolve, if some of like the databases that are feeding into the um, sort of machine learning and the neural networks, like if some of those images are opted out, like what happens to images that were generated before? Like, I, I think, you know, we faced this also with music uh, a while back uh, and sort of, you know, the rights of music changing from different eras, vinyl to CD to then web and streaming and stuff. So. I assume we'll probably get to a very similar place in terms of licensing imagery and something that perhaps actually our field needs um, in terms of, you know, we're always continuously referring to each other and sort of well, building off the history of design as well. It's a really powerful tool to kind of, you know, be able to jump off. I mean, we all have, we've built our understanding of design through the history of design. And that jumping off can be opaque or it can be transparent. And so in type design, you're almost required to say, I was looking at Garamond or I was looking at X, Y, Z. You know, I was looking at whatever piece of type design. And that's a good thing to say the source. In design, in graphic design, we usually like it's it's much more opaque and people are just much iffier about saying, I was looking at Brain Crow when it's obvious, like the, the connection is obvious for anybody that knows uh, the different designers. So I I kind of feel the transparency piece here um, might change. And it, it, what I'm saying is basically like artists like Jenny Holzer might set up a licensing sort of thing. Um, and again, this is maybe where blockchain kind of comes in and like you're able to protect your IP in a way in which it then is licensable across. But anyway, all of this is speculation. I, I don't really know, but it, it certainly we're in the middle of a larger conversation. And um, we we are protected by the sort of agreement that that was in place, but it's still like kind of uh, yeah. you know big unknowns as to how yeah. things change and how fast they can change. Yeah. Um, let me see. There's a there's another um, question. Just in terms of um, there's a couple of questions. I maybe can can merge them together in terms of the the kind of prompts that that you feed into it. Um, you know, in terms of like 
like uh, Mark was asking, could you prompt with the description of theoretical underpinnings of a particular artist or movement uh, instead of the shortcut with the artist's name? And there was kind of a similar question in terms of like where the prompts um uh eugene asked were any of the prompts super long super descriptive paragraphs you know like just just sort of like how um how your process went went through yeah no i think that what we as i mean we at the moment we start the book we were just starting also to investigate this tool i mean was the excitement of working with this tool what made this book happen in like i don't know like in two weeks or something like that <laughs> and a lot of nights there uh so yeah so when we were like investigating like of course that you can but as, as we mentioned in the talk like i feel that if you start to understand how you prompt then you start to have some uh like the ownable of an, of the image in a way like you start to be in that the art direction in a way of the image you know and what we found interesting in this process was this idea of the surprising of the image the idea of having like okay what me journey is able to do with a really short prompt where this take the reference where it takes like the inspiration of or the images you know so that was our rule, let's say, in for the book, and that was the reason we keep like really simple, um, really simple prompts. But at the same time, sometimes we feel that we need to add a couple of words, like really like keywords, because of the machine can, yeah, sometimes can't give us like the result that we achieve. But or, you or, can see like yeah, or like, the art is produced across a different. Uh, a number of media yeah, like yeah. like Picasso or Jean yeah. Arp like Jean yeah. Arp had collage had uh, yeah. sculpture has own so cool. it actually was a really great way to kind of get familiar deep more deeply familiar with a lot of the artists that we respected and understand their production and what are like sort of the key moments in their uh, sort of output as artists um, it, it was just an interesting exercise altogether and we did find a couple of new ones in the process but yeah we we tried to keep it open at some point we just decided like let's just keep it as open so that the ai is interpreting because that's the idea for the book yeah if yeah. you're doing it like in a studio nowadays you're doing prompts that are so specific yeah and you can just add on as this addition of very particular things um that establish like the way a thing is framed the way you're almost are directing uh, yeah yeah and that's part of the development of the tool in a way like now like when we start to do the book i mean i think that there are any some words some style that weren't like in the in the actual software uh, but now yeah you can like go really deep in terms of like style and and details you know yeah um, how close do you think i mean like this is something that, that kind of came up as a as a, as a question that I, I i sort of maybe think in terms of like the feedback loop you know like in in the design sense and the kind of traditional model let's say um you know in an evolution of a project there's there's stages and iterations you know there's like you know initial design a sketch and then kind of gets developed and further refined and then there's like a creative director and art director says you know this is great but make it blue make it bigger right in terms of like the the are are we there um or about to get to the point where because i'm assuming like the way my journey works is you can't ask it to edit the image that created right it would have to start kind of a whole prompt which would get kind of close to where it just came, but you can't say like, I like what you did, but can you move this part to the right? You know, like it's not there yet, but how close do you think we are to, to being there? That, that like that tool already exists, that feature within the tool. So it's called seeding. Uh, that means you sort of establish a prompt, you like the output, and then you can refeed it. And sort of you can modify it every time recursively with new modifications. So if you seed something, it will, the output will be very similar. And people are doing it to create like, like models. Like now there's AI models, meaning people who look right. a certain way and so on. And the investigation around that is quite interesting. It, it just kind of leads to then um, the specific person that looks a certain way over time. Like what are their hairstyles, uh, uh, sort of clothing in different contexts, different lighting and so on. Um, so it's, it's actually quite close to being a super powerful kind of way of, uh sort of reimagining and working off stuff you can also feed it like we yeah. could like put a cover in and then or a typeface and then say do these things so a lot of people are doing 2d into 3d and it's a great way to kind of as you saw some of these like Giacometti for instance like the g of Giacometti looks like an actual sculpture and it it was in an earlier version of <laughs> the journey and like now it's even more accurate so there's there's a ton of ways to kind of 
use it. It's just, I think we lack the literacy yet. And some people are getting there. Um, and on top of the literacy, we lack the sort of ways in which it fits our process. And so that structure that you mentioned, creative director, art director, designer, you know, copywriter, and so on, that may be collapsed into one person that can use chat GPT to generate a text prompt that then feeds back into an AI that generates an image. And so yeah, also now like there are a lot of business that are selling prompts in a way, right? Or yeah. just like, yeah, like how, yeah, like like you have the trick of what words you should use, which is the order, you know, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can ask for yeah, specific prompts in different fields. Uh, and yeah, they charge for that. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole sub-economy being developed, which is, you know, not as interesting as the actual like kind of development in the field, but that, like anything, like any new discovery, like or development, like this really, some people speak of it almost as an industrial revolution, and it perhaps will be at that level uh, where you know we have machines functioning at a cognitive level that we've never had before. Um, so it's it's going to seep into ways that we may not notice, and ways in which we definitely will, and um, that's just the sort of an interesting thing over the next like several years um, to see where where this goes. Hopefully not the negative way that social media has gone. <laughs> and you know, but obviously uh, capitalism and everything like will definitely make its best attempt to take it there. So yeah. Well, it's it's yeah, it, it's hopefully I think I hopefully like there's there's enough kind of in, in, in that that kind of pushes it into kind of a more open ended space than 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 some of these kind of more profit tools. But you know, everything is turned into profit. But Kathleen had a quick follow-up. Um, uh, Kathleen wrote, uh, you, you can use a uh, quote in painting, in quote, with an AI to change specific parts of an image. So in addition to using CMC, it's kind of like just if, if folks are kind of curious and um, and the, and also like a prompt engineer, the next hot profession. So um, ne needing to be um, kind of a, a good type, a copywriter and, 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 and thinking of prompts. But I think in a way, like I think about sort of the, the, the um, a visual research component of, of a lot of design, which is still traditional kind of part of the practice and, and certainly kind of, I think the bulk of visual research for mood boards and, and kind of establishing of like contextualizing is done through digital technology. It's done through Google searches. And to me, you know, that's that's the chat bot, basically. You're interacting with a tool that you have to be specific about what you put in in order to generate the results that you're looking for. So you type in like, I don't know, Swiss design, you're going to get like a soup of things. And, and some of it is... But like Swiss design, what you know, it's like, it, it's the algorithm that interprets what you're asking, and so in order to get to um, a better result in terms of the process of what you're looking for, what you're digging for, you have to be quite specific and in interacting with these tools. So I think we already kind of are trained to be better at prompting the tools to to get kind of better results. As you know, we've had to use these as designers for a little bit of time now. That's that's a really sharp point, I think, because. Um the accuracy of the output is determined by how narrow the request is and so it's really it, it sort of demands that you have a knowledge of design and the deeper you know design the better you'll be able at prompting it to design outcomes and so really it, it, like what's interesting is it then hinges all on vocabulary i wonder if that's going to change um and probably will there, there may be a bridge that is built so that you don't have to have that level of literacy. But um, yeah, had we not been fairly familiar with the history of art, um, then this probably wouldn't have been equally as possible. You know, and it's like you really need to kind of uh, uh, sort of have a certain understanding of it. So researching and archiving is actually quite, quite important in it's interesting. It's like the opposite. It's sort of the history enables you to create the future. And that's always sort of like a really powerful kind of jump in time. So the other thing, too, I mean, like what you're saying kind of makes me think certainly in terms of like, you know, connecting, of course, physically for myself, you know, being in an archive and you guys are familiar with with the space and hopefully folks watching know of us, too, or just in terms of other collections, you know, any collections, any any place that has graphic design. The, you know, I think it's a safe assumption that a lot of what they have is just not online, you know, and so there is this kind of augmented space where, you know, you go to a place that's magically opens up so many things that you have no idea exist, you know, and, and so in some ways there, 
I, I think it's just like a, a a good assumption that like one not enough is on the internet yet mm -hmm. Two, what's being used and sort of teaching and training these 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 tools is, is also limited because of what what's kind of coming in there and mm -hmm. so at some point it is kind of that thing of like do we protect this 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 material from getting you know like we i say you know very very broadly not not necessarily myself and that's not like my position as, as as this archive i think we want as much of our material to be accessible to as many people as possible but also is there you know this carve out for certain places to be still be like the trek the journey that you have to make to to physically go somewhere and like have that experience that you can't get through <laughs> AI. Well, yeah that's definitely like an interesting question i mean it, it, it rises first in like pinterest world and sort of you know google images pinterest and now arena like sort of all these references being available but at the same time like sort of the archive and i think the physical like maybe i can speak from a personal perspective the reason i sort of um find certain titles is because um of this sort of jumping off point that and these connections that they allow sort of these patterns that as you pull a book you open you randomly land on somebody's curation of a selection of design or art and then that prompts you to sort of think about okay there's like this other title and then sort of this this very rapid um way of jumping from one title to the next and sort of accruing a certain level of understanding around the topic that I think an archive allows you to do um, and the web instead is dictated by who connected what to what else and sort of what was the algorithm or the person doing and it's a little bit less dynamic in the way that we think it's more dictated and guided um, and so I don't think even if all of your <laughs> like the archives books were indexed page by page and they were in the database which would be a good thing um, it would improve the level of design and the level of visual art in in Sort of these databases um you still wouldn't you still would need the space to replicate the experience and the tangent like from a physical standpoint but also from a mental standpoint the ability to kind of jump off uh is quite unique and so yeah um i think it's just to say i think the places that we cherish are sort of hopefully timeless uh in a way you know there's a library yeah. and also i'm thinking that this is a fun question in terms of like how we are like almost now um we are so used to share everything that i recently like talked with a friend that has a, an amazing japanese graphic design collection uh, and i was like hey i'm um, and actually i have an account when i upload some of my japanese collection you know uh, and i talk with him you know, what is your stuff and he's like no 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 i am not sharing anything online <laughs> like you can have you can come here to my library but and i was like okay that's an interesting it's like okay this kind of rebel of these people that fighting back you know like okay no 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 everything online no why <laughs> like let's let's have this kind of situation where we can like meet each other we can go in through a book and yeah. and of course like the time is other like the distractions are less i mean there are many things happening there you know that's definitely a major point yeah mm -hmm. the focus of it nice well i think i think that's a good a good place to to leave um folks with with i i, I thank you both for for a really interesting uh insight and so much to think about um uh, i really appreciate it. and and i think um, the book is really great. Um, looking forward to other titles for vernacular. Um, so, so good luck with with the future projects, and and certainly kind of um, be be exploring all these things. And I'm I'm looking forward to to catching up with you both in person and uh, talking more about this. And and thank you everyone for for coming, for listening to us, and and to listening to uh, Andre and and Martin um, talk about their their insights. So super super big th thank you to everyone we'll see everyone on april 10th uh, do come back uh, for alexandra's talk at uh, 12 30 eastern um and then another cycle in 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 the summer so and then typographics so thank you martin thank you andrea yeah. beautiful thank you so much yeah thank you very much for us like incredible to be here and i remember as i told you before the talk like the first time i came to the archive uh like being doing this talk now is like incredible yeah. so yeah happy yeah thank uh, you so much sasha and thank you to the archive and cooper union as well uh and everyone who attended yeah thank you everyone for coming and uh catch a recording of this it's it's up it's it will be up there soon so uh it's on youtube and then will be up on vimeo so thanks again have a great night everyone uh We'll see you soon. Be safe. Be healthy. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Okay, bye.